Hey, good morning, Bible study friends. Gary Frazier here. And uh, just once again, grateful that you're joining us to continue our uh, special three-part series in, in uh, actually sharing our faith. You know, we've talked about this before. So many of us have lost loved ones, family members, friends, and so forth. And, and the truth of the matter is you have a passion and concern for them because you know that if Jesus came today or they were to die, that you don't, you don't believe that they would go to heaven. And yet you want them to, and that's a normal response of compassion and love, the same kind of love and compassion that Jesus has for all of us. And even for us, when we were not born again, not part of God's forever family, and someone, some way, somehow, we got the message and we put our faith and trust in Christ. And as a result of that, we want to share that. I've often said we're like the beggar. We, you know, we have the bread and people are begging for it. And so let's share the bread with them. But we're going to get an into this in just a moment. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for your uh, unbounded grace. Lord, thank you that, that you love us. You looked down through the halls of history <clears throat> and you saw us and you loved us and you gave yourself on the cross for us. And you brought someone, some way, somehow across our path so that we could know you intimately and personally. And for that, we're grateful. So bless our time together today and make it productive as we've often asked you to do for the kingdom's sake. And Lord, this is about kingdom business, and that is reaching people with the good news of Jesus Christ. And we ask these things in your name, knowing that we're praying according to your will. Amen. Well, today we're going to continue our series. Now, last week we uh, began by sharing a testimony, and we looked at Paul's testimony as recorded there in Acts chapter 26, where Paul uh, is... Uh, is sharing, first of all, <clears throat> what he was before he came to know Christ, how he came to know Christ on the Damascus Road, and then what God was doing in his life as a result of that. <clears throat> so those are the key, excuse me, but those are the elements of a personal testimony. But I want you to understand today that our testimony is a valuable part of our own personal experience. So today we're going to jump in now that we looked at that episode last week in part one. Now part two, we're going to get into the five steps of sharing our faith. And then next week, I'm going to be doing some role playing and actually sit down with someone and show you kind of to give you some idea of how this would, could, could flow along and how you could do this easily yourself. So why do we want to share? Well, let me first of all say we want to share our faith because Jesus has changed our lives. And so as a natural result of, of a changed life, being born into God's forever family, we have a desire to share it with others. But then secondly, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> secondly, we have a command and a promise. You see, in Matthew 28, 19 through 20, there is, first of all, a command. And here's the command. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and teaching them to obey, obey everything or all things that I've commanded you. So the commander-in-chief, the Lord Jesus Christ, has given this command to his followers. And so we're to go out and share our faith. We are to be witnesses of his incredible mercy and grace and love. But then the pro there's a promise. And then he says, and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. So, so let me make something perfectly clear. When we're sharing our faith, we are doing what God has commanded us to do. And the promise attached to that is I'm going to be with you. You see, we can't really do this in our own power. But the Lord Jesus Christ chooses to live within us. And because he lives within us, he works through us to take that message to those we care about and to other people. And he's promised that he will be with us. You know, the Bible says that Christ is in us and he's promised never to leave us, nor will he ever forsake us. And so then 2 Timothy tells us something else. Paul writes to Timothy and in 2 Timothy 2, 2, he says, and the things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. Uh, and so the bottom line here is, is that, we're not just wanting to share and have people born of the family of God. We also want them to become witnesses. We want to entrust them the with the truths that we've been uh, taught so that we can do a multiplication process. You know, when I went to pastor in the city of New Orleans, one of the things that my desire, one of the goals that I had was that we would train 100 personal soul winners so that we could so that we could attack the community in which we were living <clears throat> and serving with the good news of Jesus Christ. 
And so we want to not only know how to do something ourselves, but we want to teach our others also so that they can have the same joy that we can have. So with that in mind, today we're going to look not just at, at uh, why, but the how of sharing our faith. So the gospel, and I want to say this be, to be clear about this, should never be the best kept secret in this dying world. And yet for the largest part it is because 99% of evangelical believers have never shared their faith one single time with another person. It's like we found the truth, but we don't want to share that truth. Or even if we do want to share it, fear factor takes over and we're afraid to do so. And so that's part of the issue here. But I want you to know that sharing our faith is a simple conversation and it is not a confrontation. You know, years ago, I had a good friend of mine. His name was uh, Walter K. Ayers. And Walter was an evangelist. He had played football at the University of Arkansas. He had also been quite a boxer and, and boxed professionally for a period of time. And Walter was one of these guys where he was a man's man, but Walter would confront a man about the gospel. And basically what he would say is, is that I'm going to share the gospel with you, whether you like it or not. If you don't like it, I'm going to twist my, I'm going to break your arm or something. I mean, he was just a, a very unusual kind of an individual. He grew up in De Queen, Arkansas, and he was a mess. But I want to tell you something. We're not talking about forcing people to do anything. We're talking about just having a conversation with them. So I want you to understand, we're not trying to be confrontational. We just want to talk to somebody and share with them because we love them and because we care about them. And so the truth is, people are often open to talk to those who they feel are genuinely interested in them. You know, the bottom line is when you really care about someone, they get that. They understand it. And so they, they're more willing to be open to have a conversation when, uh, when they know that you care and you're interested in it. So we begin our journey today, and this is really important. I want you to take the time to sit down, not this morning or not today when you look at the video, but as soon as you finish watching this, and write out your personal testimony. Now, if you've never done this, you have to do it. And here's why. <clears throat> as we already said in last week's message, your personal story belongs to you. No one can refute it because you were there. I shared a little bit of my personal testimony. And so I was there when it happened. And no one can tell me that Jesus Christ did not step out of heaven and step into the life of this six-year-old little boy. And even though I wandered away from the Lord over time, God continued to love me and draw me back to himself. And he's promised never to abandon us and so forth. And so your story is yours and it's powerful and no one can refute it. So I want you to sit down. And I want you to write out your story of how you came to know Jesus. But here's the kicker. I want you to do this so that you can share this in about three to five minutes. And that requires practice, practice, practice on your part. So let me just illustrate how this goes about. So step number one in learning to share our faith is first, we're going to write our personal testimony. And we're going to work on it so that we can share it, as I said, between three minutes to five minutes. Listen, I can share my testimony in as little as three minutes. And in maximum, I could spend two to three hours talking to someone about the experiences that I've had and how God drew me and how I came to know Christ and what he's done in my life since then. So we can, we can go on and on and on. But the bottom line is most people won't give us that much time. And so we need to learn how to be succinct in sharing the gospel of where I was, how I came to know Christ, what God has been doing in my life since then, and whatever he, what he's done for me, he can do and will do for you. So step number one is the conversation is simply or begins by simply getting to know something about the person by listening to what they say. In other words, you're, there's some type of a dialogue that takes place. You can't just walk up to somebody and say, I'm going to tell you about Jesus whether you want to hear it or not. No. There has to be some type of a, of a conversation and that you're involved in and so forth. For example, Sandra and I were on a flight from Atlanta back to Dallas a number of years ago. <clears throat> and uh, it's been six or seven years ago now, I suppose. And so what happened was uh, we're seated. I'm in the middle seat and Sandra's by the window. And so uh, a very nice looking, well-dressed man came and sat down on the aisle seat beside me. And we started talking about, you know, hey, uh, do you live in Dallas? No, no, I, I live in the Atlanta area. I'm going to Dallas on business and so forth and so on. And, and, and we were just, so we said, well, we were, we were in Atlanta. Uh, I was in Atlanta speaking at a church, and we were on our way back home to, to the DFW area and so forth and so on. And, and so just this conversation, just an easy going, smooth conversation. And so then as we were talking, 
I was listening very carefully to everything he said because people will talk to you, they'll tell you things if you are listening. So step one is listen. Step two is there are two diagnostic questions and you have to ask these questions and you must listen very, very carefully to their answers because they're gonna give you great insight into what they believe. So question number one is this. In a very simple and relaxed way, you make it your own uh, by just learning and memorizing. But the question is, you know, have you come to the place in your spiritual life where you know for certain if you were to die today that you would go to heaven? And, and that's what I asked the man sitting beside me as we talked for a while. And finally, I said, hey, would you mind if I, if I ask you a couple of questions? And he said, oh, no, uh, that's fine. What do, you, what do you want to ask me? And I said, well, I just wonder if you've come to, this place, to a place in your spiritual life where you know for certain if you were to die today, that you would go to heaven. So that's question number one, diagnostic question number one. Now the question number two is, so when I asked him that question, he said, well, I sure hope so. And most people will respond by saying, I hope so, uh, maybe, uh, you know, or something like that. But, but very rarely do you get a person who will say, absolutely, I know that for a fact. But the second question is even more important because it diagnose, the diagnosis of this question is, what, why do they think they're going to go to heaven if they say that they are? So the second question is, <clears throat> and I posed it to him. Suppose you were to die tonight and you found yourself standing before God and he said to you, well, I should let you into my heaven. What, what do you think you might say or what would you say? And he said, well, I, uh, he answered it by saying, well, I, I think I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a good person. And uh, uh, I, I know I'm not perfect, he said, but I, I think I'm a good person. And he kind of went on to elaborate some of that. These are the two most important questions you can ask because one tells us whether or not they think they're going to go to heaven. And the second question tells, tells us why they think they would go to heaven. And most people have never, ever thought about what they might say if they were standing in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. So here is the transition and you must memorize this. Now, some of this presentation <clears throat> requires a certain amount of memorization. Let me be frank about that. Why? Because we, we don't share our faith because we're fearful. But when we know things and when we learn things and we hide them in our heart, the Holy Spirit can pull them up in our heart and our mind and use those things. For example, I've shared this before with you, but I'll tell you it once again. You know, I uh, learned to fly when I was very young and I'm sitting in the left side of the captain's seat in an airplane and, and the engine is running and I've got a, an instructor here to, in the right side in the passenger seat. And, uh, and frankly, I'm afraid I'm about to push in the power and take this airplane off and I've never flown an airplane before and knew very little about that at that point in time. But as my instructor explained to me and taught me about the aerodynamics of flight. He said, Gary, you know, these wings are designed to provide lift. And that's what happens when the airplane starts moving through the air. The wind and air acts upon the, on the wings and it provides lift. And the engine, when you give it the power, that provides thrust. And so those two things combined is what causes an airplane to fly. And an airplane is designed and built to fly. You can trust that this airplane will fly and so here's what we're going to do. You're going to press in that, you're going to push in the, uh, the throttle and we're going to take off. And so I'm sitting there thinking, well, you know, I'm pretty sure this airplane is going to fly because this guy knows what he's talking about. And once I understood the dynamics of it, then my fear kind of melted away. And, and so this is really, really important to make this kind of a transition. And as I said, this is something that you have to memorize. And so here it is. You say to him or to her, if I could share with you how you can know for absolute, and this is really important, for absolute certainty that you can go to heaven, would you be interested? Now, remember, we just asked him, do you know for certain that if you were to die that you would go to heaven? And if you did find yourself standing in front of the Lord and he asked you, why should I let you go to heaven? What would you think he would say? So we've already done that. So now we say, so if I could share with you how you can know absolute, for absolute certainty that you can go to heaven, would you be interested? Now, look, if a person responds to those questions and says, listen, I know that I'm going to heaven. 
And when you say, well, why do you think, what would you think you might say? And he would, and they, he or she would say something to the effect, because I put my faith and trust in Jesus and he saved me and he's changed my life. Listen, that's a person you can just say, well, hallelujah. Praise God, you're part of God's forever family because of that positive witness. But if they can't do that, then you come to this place after those two questions. If I could share with you in just a few minutes, you can add that or delete it, whatever. But if I can share with you how you can know for absolute, and this is key, absolute certainty that you can go to heaven, would you be interested? Now, most people will say, well, yeah. However, if they say, no, I don't care, I don't want to know about that, well, then we just say, okay, no problem. We graciously thank them for their time and we leave them alone. Or in this case, you might walk away. Here I am on an airplane. I couldn't do that. I couldn't go anywhere. But I could have said, well, hey, no problem, man. I just appreciate the opportunity of talking to you for these few moments and so forth. But do it gracefully because we want to leave a good positive thought in their mind and heart about who we are as representatives of the Lord Jesus Christ because that is, in fact, who we are. We are representatives of the Lord Jesus Christ. So if they say yes, then, if they say yes, you can, you know, I'd like to know that. Then they're open to hear the truth, and from there you proceed. Now, and the way you proceed is here's the how of it, not the why, but the how. Now, the Bible is the only book in the world that offers eternal life, and here's what it says. And we're going to talk about five points, and the first one is grace. The Bible says that heaven is a free gift. It is not earned, nor is it deserved. Now, this is really important because, again, all of man's religions break down into one or two camps. All of religion, churches, etc., etc., it's always the same. Either you are presenting uh, the gospel to say that for those who I know Christ personally, I put my faith and trust in him alone, or it's by works. And the majority of all of man's religions, in fact, not the majority, but all of them are by works. It is only the relationship that Jesus offers in the Word of God. And so it begins by simply saying heaven is a free gift and it's not something that is earned nor is it deserved. And Romans 6.23 tells us that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So what you're establishing here right up front is that God loves you and he has a free gift for you and that gift is called heaven, but you can't work for it. You can't be good enough. You can never earn it because if that were possible, and I'm just talking to you about this, you let this sink in your mind, But if, because if that were possible that you could do something to earn your way in heaven, then Jesus would have never died on the cross. This is imperative. So don't, these are some things that you have to learn. There are only five points and there's a scriptures, some scriptures that go with it. And it is worthy of your time to learn these things. So you can take an index card, you can write the scriptures, you can write the, the, the point of the outline on it, you can write the scriptures down, you can tape them on your mirror in the bathroom where you do your hair or where you shave or brush your teeth or whatever the case may be, but go over them and over them and over them. Ladies and gentlemen, we're commanded to do this. We're commanded to be witnesses. And so the wages of sin is death, but the gift, notice the word gift, a gift is something that you don't earn. It is not something that you deserve. It is something that someone gives freely. And that's exactly what Jesus did when he gave himself on the cross. So first of all, there's grace. But then you go on and say, secondly, that man is a sinner and he can't save himself. You see, no matter what we do, we could never be good enough to measure up to God's standards. You know, the Bible says in Matthew 5, 48, that there is none perfect, no, not one. And in Romans 3, 23, he goes further and Paul says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So even if a person thinks they're a good person, even if they think that they do all of these wonderful things and so forth, they can never be good enough. Why? Because the standard is perfection. And there was only one per person who's ever lived on this earth that was without sin in perfection. So all have sinned, come short of the glory of God. I mean, all is an encompassing word, is it not? So the bottom line is man is a sinner. We've got a problem here and he can't save himself. And so first of all, there's grace in our first point in our outline. And secondly, man is the second point. So then we go to the third point because the Bible tells us, well, actually, let me inject this right quick. In, in, in uh, Ephesians 2, 8, it says, For by grace you save through faith, not of works. So this is yet another verse that you're going to want to memorize. 
But, so the third point is simply this, but God, so God is the third point, but God is merciful and loving, and he does not want to punish us, but he's righteous and he must punish sin. And so here's what's important for us to understand. First of all, we talk about the grace of God. Then we talk about the fact that man is a sinner. But then thirdly, we bring God into the picture and we want them to understand that God loves us, that God is merciful, he's gracious. Listen, there is a reality. One of two places people will spend eternity, either heaven in the presence of the Lord Jesus, and they can only get there one way through trust in him, or separated from him in a place called hell. And by the way, if you're not familiar with Luke chapter 16, you really need to read that passage about the rich man and Lazarus and the rich man who died and went to hell and so forth. You need to, to read that because you may want to refer people to that passage of scripture at some point in time. But because God is, is a merciful God, that's one thing, but he's also a just God. And as a result of that, man's sin demands punishment. But let me be clear. <clears throat> hell was never created for us. Hell was created for Satan and the fallen demons who had rebelled against heaven, uh, hell, uh, against uh, the Lord Jesus, against God the Father, rather, excuse me, in, um, in heaven. And Isaiah 14 tells us and gives us the information on this if you want to look at that. But having said that, he's righteous and so he has to punish sin. Sin is a choice. Sin is our, and it's also by, our, by the way, it's our sinful nature. And so God must punish us because there's a consequence to the choices and the decisions that we make to go our own way. So how did God solve this problem? Well, the answer is he solved it with the man, Jesus, who was fully man, yet fully God. And so who is Jesus and what did he do? So remember, point one, grace, point two, man, point three is God, point four now, we come to Jesus. So now who is he and what did he do? Now Jesus is God in the flesh who came as a man yet lived a sinless life. And John said in John 1 29, when he saw Jesus walking toward him, John the Baptist said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So John the Baptist recognized that Jesus was a unique individual because he was the one who came from God and who was going to take away the sin of the world. Though he never sinned, he was crucified to pay our debt. Let me be clear about something. The Jews didn't kill Jesus. The Romans didn't kill Jesus. No one killed Jesus. Jesus laid down his life as the sinless sacrifice for me and for you. I can't imagine why Jesus would love us that way, but in the eternal plan of God, the mercy and the grace of God was exhibited through the Lord Jesus because Jesus came to show us the love of the heavenly father. And what he received in return for his offer of love was a Roman cross. But remember this, it was my sin and your sin that nailed him to the cross. But he paid that to, to he, he died on the cross to satisfy our sin debt with God. Now, one of the things that I think is important is, is that not only did he die, but here's the real important thing. Three days later, after he'd been in the grave for three days and three nights, he arose from the grave. And the fact that he rose was the evidence that God the Father accepted the sacrifice of Jesus. And so he brought him back to life. And so Jesus lives today in and through us. He came to dwell within all who would receive him. And so he lives in us. And so he did for us what we could never do for ourselves. And he was then the payment for our sin to reconcile us to God. And then he gives us this free gift of eternal life. And all we have to do is notice accept it. The reason I put accept in red is because I wanted to symbolize that we become, we, we put our faith in him because of the shed blood of the Lamb of God. So all we have to do is accept what Jesus did. So how do we accept what he did? We accept it by faith. The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith. Now a moment ago we used that verse to say, <clears throat> it is a free gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But here we want to just focus on the fact that we're saved by grace through the vehicle, the means of faith. So we have five points. Grace, we have man, God, Jesus, and now we come to the fifth point in our outline, which is we receive what Jesus did by faith. So what is it? 
Well, let me explain, first of all, what faith is not. Faith is not just saying one believes in God, because as you can see, James 2.19 says, you believe that there's one God. Well, that's good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. So what's, what's the issue here? Because the truth is, just a couple of days ago, I had the opportunity to share Jesus with a friend of mine that I'd known for a number of years, and we played golf together, and we just had one of those divine appointment meetings in a restaurant. <clears throat> and one of the things that, that I said to him was, you know, if we walked around this restaurant and we went table by table by table, and we asked people, do you believe in God? Well, probably nine out of 10 people would say, yes, they believe in God. But that's no big deal. So pin a rose on your nose. You believe in God. So does the devil. So <laughs> what then does the word believe really mean? Well, the problem is understanding the word believe. And I don't want to get into the weeds here in the Greek text and so forth. But the word that really is translated into the English is believe is simply more than just an intellectual assent that there's a God. In other words, saying, oh, I believe in God. I, you know, my mind tells me that he exists. I look at nature. I see the handiwork of, of God and so forth and so on and the beautiful world he created and all. And I believe. Well, that's not really it. Because to believe is a word that means to trust. Now, I put in parentheses <clears throat> the illustration of walking on a tightrope. And you've heard me say this before, but I want to share this with you and I want you to learn this illustration. So it's, so it's so good to help people realize the difference between just having a head belief and having a heart commitment. And so here's the deal. I'm <clears throat> up here on a tightrope walking across back and forth and you are sitting there on the ground or standing and you're looking at me and I come down and I say to you, do you believe that I can walk the tightrope? And you say, yeah, I believe you can do it. I've been watching you do it. And I say, okay, well, if you believe I can do it, then get on my shoulders and let me take you for a walk. Now you immediately realize that one, one of those types of beliefs says, oh, I've made a decision based on what my eyes have seen, what my mind comprehends, that you can walk the tightrope. You can do it. But then when you say, if you really believe, if you trust that I can do it, exhibit that, act on it, get on my shoulders, and let me take you for a walk. That's exactly what the Lord Jesus wants us to do. We can believe with our head, but it takes trust from our mind, our heart, our life to say, Lord, I'm willing to trust you with everything. As I was sharing with this man the other day in the restaurant, <clears throat> I just reached over and pushed a chair back because we were seated at a table, you know, and I'm here and he's there and there's an empty chair and an empty chair. So I just reached over and pushed this chair back. And I said to him, listen, I just want to ask you a question. I want you to look at this chair. And I put my hand in the seat and kind of pad on. This is a sturdy looking chair. I think you'd agree with that. And, um, and, and so this chair is actually designed to support you. So I can say, well, do you believe this chair will support you if you sit down in it? And you can say, yeah, I, I believe that. But you see, you really haven't exhibited trust in the chair's ability to support you until and unless you sit in the chair. And the moment you sit in the chair, then you've exhibited trust. You know, we do this almost every time we get an automobile. In fact, we do it every time we get an automobile. And you know what that is? We're driving down the road and we have faith and trust that when we put our foot on the brake, that it's going to stop this car or slow it down. That is an act of faith. We know the mechanics. We don't know all the details and ins and outs of how the braking system may work and, and so forth and so on. But we know that when we put our foot on it, we're exercising trust, believing it will do it. And that's exactly what we have to do to put our faith in Jesus Christ. And so I've already mentioned the illustration of flying an airplane, but here's the point. I could sit there all day long and talk about the the aerodynamics of the plane and how I really truly believed it would, that the plane would fly, but I didn't exercise trust in that until I pressed the, accel the throttle in and, we, and I allowed that airplane to go up into the air. That's when I was showing that I actually trusted the, in the airplane's ability to get off the ground and fly. So, and I used the illustration of sitting in a chair just there. So does this, so here's the next response. So after you share these things, then you very nicely say, hey, let me ask you a question. <clears throat> Does this make sense to you? And there are only two responses. It's either yes or no. And so if they say no, you can ask this question. This is really important. Don't just accept no and, and, and walk away. If they say no, say, well, let me ask you a question. 
what, what doesn't make sense to you? Now, most of the time, people will say, well, I don't understand how there can be a God in heaven and how, can, how Jesus can be God on the earth. Now, I want you to understand the answer is simple, and that is that God is three yet one. But with our finite minds, we can't grasp this because the Bible makes it clear that the Godhead exists as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And people have tried to explain this every way in the world from the egg, you know, the shell, the white, the yellow, and all these kinds of things. But three in one, but only when we get to heaven are we going to really comprehend or understand that. Because the truth of the matter is, I don't think anybody can sufficiently understand what the Trinity, what the Godhead is all about. And yet we know there are three in one. The Bible tells us in the very pages of, the, of Genesis, in the beginning, the creation. And, and it says that God, we, we're going to... That, God, that Christ was with us, he, and it says that we are created in our image, that man was created in our image. That's God saying. Well, what image? He used the plural, our, so more than one. And so this is a question that people will throw at you often, and sometimes questions are thrown out simply because instead of them saying, no, I don't care about this, and I don't want to talk anymore, they'll throw up a, an excuse of some kind. But sometimes, and most of the time, I think, in my experience, I've found these are valid questions that people have. And so what you want to do is you want to be kind of clear and just say, well, you know, we're not going to understand everything here in this world. We just don't have the ability with that little finite mind. But one day, the Bible says we're going to know everything. And you want to draw them back to the main point of what matters. And so another issue is religion is church. Many people are confused and they've had bad experiences with religion. And I get that. And so we just have to remind them, let's draw them back into the conversation and say, well, you know, I certainly can understand there are a lot of people that have bad uh, experiences with, with religion and, and, and church you know, overall. But you have to remember this. A church is just a place where a bunch of sinners who have been saved by God's grace get together to praise the Lord and to worship and to be instructed and to learn uh, the, the Word of God more definitively. But having said that, let, let's don't deal with the church because here's the truth. If you found what you thought was a perfect church and you joined it, you would have just messed it up. So let's, let's talk. Let, let me come back to what we were talking about you know, before. And the issue here is not about religion, but it's about a relationship with Jesus. So bring them back to the main point. And if they say yes, then you can proceed with it if this does. And remember a while ago was, does this make sense to you? And they said well, no, because they have these issues. But if they say, yes, it does make sense to them, then you are, then the question is, and you can phrase it this way, if this makes sense to you, then are you willing to receive the free gift of Jesus, life, that he, or the gift of eternal life that Jesus is offering? And you need to learn this. If this makes sense to you, then are you willing to receive the free gift of eternal life that Jesus is offering? Now, if you are, then you can receive it by simply doing the following. So if they say, yes, I, I'd like to receive that. By the way, the man sitting on the airplane next to Sandra and I, when I asked this question, he said, yes, I, I, I'd like to have the free gift of eternal life. And so if you are, I just told him, I said, well, if you're willing, here's how you do this. First of all, A, I want you to admit that you've sinned and broken God's, law, God's laws. Those are the Ten Commandments. So you don't have a problem with that, do you? You, you can come to terms with the fact that you have either sinned in word, thought, or deed. Oh, yeah, yeah, no problem. I, I understand that. Second, I want you to be, believe, and trust in your heart and mind. Accept that Jesus, or just believe that and trust that Jesus Christ is God. And then see, confess with your mouth that Jesus is your, your personal Lord and Savior. Your Lord and Savior. Not that of someone else, but your personal Lord and Savior. And here's how we do this. We come to terms with this with simply a prayer of salvation. And so I said to him, if you're willing to put your faith and confidence, trust in Jesus, and you're willing to admit that you're a sinner and you believe these things, then could, could I pray with you? And, and if so, uh, I'm going to pray this little simple prayer. And if you'll just repeat it after me. Now, I do want you to understand there's nothing magical about this prayer. The words can be whatever. But basically all we're saying is this, Dear Lord, I know that I'm a sinner and that I cannot save myself. And so I ask you to forgive me of my sin and come into my life right now and save me. And I want to thank you for saving me. Amen. Now keep in mind, ladies and gentlemen, the, the words, the prayer is not the important part because God, is already, God already knows the heart. 
God's looking on the heart. And will there be people who may do this and really not be truthful in the sense of desirous? Maybe they're just doing it to get rid of you or me or whatever the case may be. Eh, maybe, but that's not our business. Our business is just to tell the truth because we're a witness and we don't judge them as to what their motive may or may not be. But this is just a simple prayer. And, and I've led hundreds of hundreds of people to faith in Christ by just simply saying, Lord, I know that I'm a sinner. I know I can't save myself. What we're really saying is I can't work hard enough or do good, be good enough, et cetera, to save myself. And so I ask you to forgive me of my sin and come into my life right now and save me. And then I want to thank you for saving me. This is just a simple prayer that so many people have used. And so if they pray this prayer with you, then welcome them into the family of God and encourage them to start reading the Bible with the Gospel of John. Refer them to our Bible study on John. They can go back in the Gospel on, on YouTube and start with Lesson 1 in the Gospel of John and just watch and learn these videos in the days that follow as they're reading the Word of God. And also, as I said, this is really important because they can do all this on YouTube and it helps them as it has helped all of us to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is step two in learning how to share our faith. It involves a personal testimony. It involves a simple five-point outline. And while today I've elaborated on a lot of these things, but listen, remember that on YouTube you can watch it over and over and over again. Don't, you know, don't, don't fail to write your testimony out and to work on it, to learn it, to internalize it. You know, Peter tells us in the Word of God that we ought to be ready to give a reason for the hope that lies within us. Well, I have a hope that lies within me because one Sunday night in a church in Garland, Texas, as a six-year-old little boy, <clears throat> I gave my life to Christ. And I can share my story briefly, as I said to you in the beginning of this video, in three to five minutes or three hours. Bottom line is, it happened to me. It's real it's my story. But then to learn these out, this outline, these little simple five steps that we've been through, and then the, the diagnostic questions and the transition sentences and the scriptures. And I know it sounds like a lot, but listen to me. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, you can do this. So Father, I pray that your blessing, that your anointing would be upon my dear friends. And Lord, I pray for your glory that we would commit ourselves to be the strong, courageous witnesses that you would have us to be in the closing days in the history of this world as we know it. Lord, you're coming soon, and the door to the ark will be slammed, and no one else will be able to come in. So allow us in these days ahead to use these great truths to bring as many people into the family of God as we can, reminding ourselves that you are a gracious and loving God. You're always drawing people to yourself because it is your will that every man, woman, and boy and girl would come into a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. We love you and praise you. And until we meet again, may the Lord richly bless you and may he keep you.